this is Beyond Busy. I'm Graham Alcott. I'm the author of a number of books, including the global bestseller, How to Be a Productivity Ninja. And I'm the founder of Think Productive. We work with some of the world's leading companies to help people get stuff done, but more importantly, to help people to make space for what matters. Beyond Busy is where I explore the often messy truths and contradictory relationships around topics like work-life balance, happiness and success, and explore with interesting people what makes them tick. In short, this is where we ask the bigger questions about work. My guest today is Tim Ringo. Tim is the author of the book Solving the Productivity Puzzle, and he's also an award-winning human resources conference speaker and consultant. In this episode, we talk about the productivity paradox, the three-dimensional definition of productivity and getting things done. And we also talk about AI and how that impacts productivity and the definition of work. And at the end, we also talk about what he calls pro-tirement. So working when you no longer need to financially, but you don't fancy retirement just yet. This is Tim Ringo. with Tim Ringo. How are you doing? Very good. Thanks very much for having me on. You're very welcome. And it's, uh, it's miserable where I am today. And it sounds like it's, um, it's raining quite heavily in London as well, right? Yeah, it is, Graham. And uh, it's just interesting, just as you mentioned that the, uh, the rain just eased off. So thank you very much for that. <laughs> yeah, well, let's hope it doesn't affect our um, recording. And yeah. um, let's dive in at the beginning and talk about your book, which is Solving the Productivity Puzzle. That's which, right. Given the the subject matter of this podcast, and you know, we love to talk about productivity and also um, to journey around the subject of productivity and explore what it is and what it isn't, and um, you know, various debates around that. So let's just start with the premise of the book. So the productivity puzzle is one of these terms that gets banded around a lot in the media. Mm-hmm. Do you want to just for those people who are less familiar with it? And for those of us who are more familiar with it as well, just refresh our minds with what do we mean when people talk about solving the productivity puzzle? What is the problem? Yeah, there's a couple of things going on. Um, so the, the most immediate is that for the past 10 years, and it's the longest period in measured you know, economic history, we've seen steady decline or stagnation of people productivity. Um, and you know, a lot of economists are really stumped uh, by it. And I found it a fascinating um, uh, subject when I stumbled across an OECD article that said, you know, not only is this a problem now, but it's going to impact out 50 years. And basically because, you know, people productivity is not keeping up, we're going to see steady p- downward pressure on GDP, um, which means we're going to see downward pressure on GDP per capita, which very simply means that living standards today are not going to be as good as they are in 50 years. So I just found that overly pessimistic. So there's kind of that, you know, situation that's happening at the moment, right? So 10 years, I looked at that. Um, and tried to get underneath, you know, what are the challenges, but really, you know, focused on the solution for it. And and part of the solution was the other aspect, which is that, um, you know, essentially um, productivity is not defined correctly and we're not measuring it correctly at the moment. So that's another thing that I, that I came on to when I went to go look at it. So I looked at, you know, I immediately when I sat down to write the book, I said, right, um, let me go look up the definition of productivity. So I looked it up in various um, economic books, and it was pretty much the same, and it's kind of the following. Various measures of the efficiency of production. A productivity measure is expressed as the ratio of output to inputs used in a production process. And right away, I saw a major problem, which is that that's not very 21st century. That is early 20th century when 70 80% of people worked on a farm or in a factory. Um, and so they were, they were widget producers or, or pickers of fruit or that sort of thing. Um, but you, you fast forward to 21st century, it's the, the equations flipped. It's more than 70% of people, you know, work in an office or these days work from home and work in knowledge work. And it, that's really a hard thing to measure in a yeah. lot of ways if you're using that as a definition. So I had to really redefine what productivity is and make a more three-dimensional definition and that's what i based the book around which is a different you know updated 
definition that I propose and people seem to like. Um, and I think then we can we we can measure it, which you know gets to the kind of final piece of the uh, of the puzzle, which is and this is where the productivity paradox comes in, which is has been around for many years, which essentially says that you know every time we have big technology inflections. Um, you know, we should have big leaps in people's productivity. And we do see that during periods, but we also see periods of technological inflection that actually reduces productivity. And we're in one of those at the moment. Mm. Um, and they call it the paradox because you would think when you get, you know, new technologies, it should, um, it should help people, um, you know, become more productive. But what we're seeing now, and this is what I found in my research, is that the technology in the past 10 years has been overwhelming people. And organizations have not been uh, very good at aligning people to that technology and investing in them to align to that technology. And we're we're really only getting back to where we were, you know, say early 2000s in terms of levels of investment in that space. So, you know, long and short, well, that was sort of a, a, a short story long. Those are kind of the, the aspects that I looked yeah. at. And that kind of tells you the facts. But that productivity paradox is, you know, really, really interesting. And I think it's part of what the problem is right now. Let's um, let's come back to that the paradox part of it in a moment. Can you just talk a bit more about the definition? So the more yeah. three dimensional definition of productivity. So how's how's, how's yeah that certainly. Going? So um, you know essentially when I looked at it, I thought you know um, obviously there's a physical side, which is what that classical definition is is defining. It's inputs outputs, and and yeah. there's a value to that. That we have to have that, right? I mean, you know, even the the, the communist Chinese these days are capitalists, right? So it's a part of the equation, and it's a big part of it. So, but but I, I feel like there's other pieces to it, um, and so I came up with the following definition to expand it, and this is in the book. So it's getting stuff done that measurably improves the economic and human interests of organizations and society at large. So it's not just about people producing widgets. It's about um, the economy. It's about the humans inside of that economy. It's the organizations and society. And people's work these days and their efforts impacts all of those things. Um, and that's kind of more three-dimensional. And basically, I broke that down into three areas. I said, right, there's the value piece. Obviously, we need to measure that. But there's another piece that I call engagement, which is, you know, a workplace that's purpose driven and gives up, gives employees the opportunity to flourish. They are not widget machines. They yeah. are, you know, human beings with with feelings and intelligence and and, you know, workplaces that allow people to thrive. Guess what? You have very engaged people who are high, highly productive. But then that, that leads to the other piece of it, which if you've got people who are engaged and highly productive, they also have time to think about, well, maybe there's a different way to do this. Maybe there's a new service or a product, and that's the innovation piece, right? So you've got value, you've got engagement, and you've got innovation. And those three things make up that, you know, they're, they're kind of encompassed in that, that new definition. Um, and so, you know, workplaces should not be drudgery focused on producing widgets. It should be a place where you go to, um, to, to contribute, but you also go to learn and to interact and think of new ways to do things. And that benefits society, it benefits organizations. And guess what? It benefits people. So I think we need to expand that. We have to measure these things. And you can measure engagement. You can measure innovation. And these things need to be inside of the definition of productivity in my mind. And do you think what was, what was in my mind there as you were talking was it feels like there are certain organizations that are really in tune with this way of thinking and really yeah. trying to really trying to push the idea of purpose and and push the idea of employee engagement and then there's a whole nother set of organizations who are almost trying to measure too much right mm, so yeah, you get the yeah, organizations yeah. where you know and and there's there's lots of famous tales in the media of, of people at Amazon wearing nappies so that they don't spend <laughs> yeah. too long off the uh, warehouse uh, sort of floor surface area and things like that. And so I suppose there's like, there's probably lots of people who would be listening to this who think, no, hang on, like, you know, my organization is obsessed with measuring productivity in that much older yeah. Um, yeah. way. And mm. so do you think there's almost like a polarity there where some organizations are at one end of the scale and then a lot of other organizations are at the, at the other end of the scale. And there isn't that mix where, yeah, the, you know, we're like maybe some, maybe some of those more purpose driven organizations are, are too obsessed with purpose and not as obsessed with what the outcomes and the results are and, and vice versa. 
Yeah, you know, I think the, the vast majority of organizations are still working in a 20th century way. It's hierarchical command control. Um, it's I give you the thing that I want you to do and you have this time in which to do it and I'll measure it at the end. Right. And yeah. that is how it was done in the, you know, in the 19th and 20th century, um, 21st century, you know, no surprise, most companies still, still work that way. And unfortunately, and I can say this cause I went to business school. I think business schools teach, you know, the kind of management class that this is the way it is. People are a cost and they're there for you to, to, to do what you, what you need them to do. And then you either hire or fire them or, or, or whatever. And, you know, I think that's a really bad way to look at it. However, there's a, there's a small number and growing number of companies that are realizing that, you know, people are much more complex and that if you can engage them in what it is you do, get them to buy into your purpose and mission as an organization, um, you suddenly get a different kind of workforce. They're, they're, they're ones that, that, that show up um, not only to produce what you ask them to do, but they produce more and they enjoy doing it. And so these organizations are a minority at the moment, but it's growing. And this is why I challenge the OECD and say, look, you've, you've painted a very pessimistic picture, but people are, organizations are starting to realize they need to change the way we work. Um, and I think the pandemic, which we can talk more about, but I think it's accelerating this this kind of um, view that, hang on a minute, why do we work the way we work? Um, and why do we have, you know, um, bosses that insist on presenteeism? Why do we, and again, I think the pandemic has blown that up. And, you know, I think it's really, p- people are starting to challenge this and organizations that have been good at this for a long time. So I'll outline a couple. So uh, IBM, and I, I worked there for quite a number of years. And when I started working there in 2006, I was recruited there from Accenture, very different organization. But I, when I got inside of IBM, I was, I was, uh, you know, really floored by how, um, you know, the ethos was about developing people. You know, you know, putting on the blue shirt, right? The IBM blue shirt, and you're part of the team, and you're part of mm-hmm. the, the, you know, the kind. It was almost like Apple inside there, right? People really were, you know, serious about being IBMers. Um, and it just created a lot of engagement, and and the head of HR and the CEO, their their offices were actually joined up. Um, you know, Randy's office was next to the CEO. That's how much valued HR was. And Randy's vision was, we're going to pl- create a place that gets the right people in the right place at the right time with the right skills and right motivation. And it's a mindset first. And then secondly, we put in a set of processes that's going to support that. And lastly, we put in technology that makes this easy for the manager and the employee to do. And I was blown away by that. And that's where I really first saw kind of what good looked like. And I write about this in the book. I write, this is essentially where that core comes from. Um, and so IBM was very good at that. And then thus you've seen other technology companies um, seem to take that mantle up as well and, and are starting to behave this way. And then that, that kind of approach is spreading throughout industry um, in recognizing that in the 21st century, this is the kind of way you want to work. You want to, you want to engage that workforce. You want to help them be successful and help them flourish. Um, and that's essentially for me, that solves the productivity puzzle at the you know highest level. Yeah. There's lots more detail in the book underneath how you do that specifically. Can we just um, take that into IBM the there? Case. And, mm-hmm. and um, I'd love to hear more about what were the particular practices that you felt were really driving that sense of purpose within IBM and, and people really feeling engaged and to become yeah. IBMers and remain I- IBMers. Yeah, I think, you know, Sam Palmasano, um, the CEO, was um, very clued up early on into collaboration technology. He was one of the early users of having a constant conversation with the organization using the intranet um, to do lots of town halls. He used that technology also to take the suggestions people were making and create a scorecard and say, right, this is the six things we all agree needs to change. Yeah. And then assign those to senior executives and say, we're going to change these things. And then he would measure them on that. Um, so first, that what I'm talking about, there was a, mi- a leadership mindset that says we're going to work in this way. Um, and he was very much about breaking down barriers to create a siloless organization, both ge- geographically and and inside of that. So that was the first thing. Someone was listening, right? right. And it was the top yeah. guy. And things were changing because you said something, right? That people would say, we want to change this. That was the first thing. And then really from there, because IBM's a technology company, they were able to build an intranet that kind of was really easy to use. You could use it to do performance management and your objectives with the, with your manager. You could use it to find learning. 
you could use it to even find a new role. So in IBM, they were one of the first to create this kind of internal marketplace for managers and employees to find each other for roles. And people could move around in this kind of marketplace um, and use the technology to do that. And that created huge amounts of engagement because it's such a huge place and there were so many things to do. You could find your next role yourself or your man- the manager could find you, mm-hmm. right? And yeah. it was kind of an internal early version of LinkedIn. Um, and so that was a, a practice. And then just a constant focus on what I call strategic workforce planning, helping to get people to the right place at the right time. Um, and and went by right place, meaning a place they want to be, right? Not that somebody tells them. Now, does it work like that all the time? 100% no. But an organization, and I certainly saw, that makes that effort to say we are going to mostly get you in the right place at the right time. Um, people appreciate that and they understand that it can't always, I can't always do what I want to do, but you know, as long as I can do it sometimes. And mm. for me, that just kind of became the kind of gold standard. And you saw lots of companies then come along like Google and others start to adapt and adopt these kind of things. And then what's happened since that was 2006, the, the mindset has started to kind of, you know, um, leak into the into industries um the processes how you re-engineer to do that are very clear now and what's really exciting is the technology so hr technology has come on leaps and bounds from a system that just holds data about you to an intelligent you know literally machine learning kind of thing that becomes almost your performance support allows you and your manager to you know, do everything that HR used to do. And that's great when your manager is involved in your learning and your objectives and your, your, you know, your, um, your rewards at the end of the year or halfway through the year. It's just, uh, you know, the technology and it, and it makes it really smart so that therefore, you know, the work for the manager and the, and the employee is actually not a lot. A lot of it's automated. And so this is allowed you know, or organizations that get this to implement this really quickly. Yeah. And then you've got, you know, people who aren't in the technology kind of looking at even in manufacturing these days and airlines and looking at and saying, Hey, we should work like this too. Mm. And it's just kind of catching on. And that's why when I say that OECD are overly pessimistic, they just don't see this. They don't see this emerging yet, but because of the industry that I've been in and my research in the book, I can see it coming and I'm really po- very optimistic about the future and solving yeah. this problem and making work less drudgery and more fun. So I work in a small company and we use Slack and we use the Office 365 kind of world, right? But I I can't really think what we would be using that would perform the functions that you were just talking about there. So like a piece of technology that would be, you know, holding all of the data around performance and targets and and all of that stuff being automated in the background so what are the what are the products that people are you know really using to uh you know to really take that to the next level yeah these are usually you know grouped together by industry analysts in the kind of hr technology space so um and the 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 platforms that i really think are on the on the you know front edge of this are a, you know a few of the big ones like SAP Success Factors, yeah. Workday, which people in Oracle. But I think more exciting are these smaller um, startups, and some of them are beyond startup. They've been around for a while. Um, you know, are coming at um, HR technology from a, not a system of record, but from a how do we make how do we make people better? Yeah. Um, and so these are systems like um, that I think are fantastic, like Personio, which is out of Germany. Uh, Simpa, which is out of um, uh, you know Finland, um, in the UK, you know there's there, there's quite a few uh, you know r- really good ones that 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 are emerging, um, you know a few from France, and these are the way you find them is you can look under um, HR cloud technology, and you'll get okay. you know lists on Google, and 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 what's really interesting is that it isn't only just big companies that can afford these these days. These solutions are subscriptions, a few dollars a person. Yeah. So if you're a small organization, you can literally go on to some of these with a credit card and buy 30 licenses um, and implement that. And then you can link your Slack up to it. Right. So it's got an API and you can start to create this kind of performance platform for, you know, very little money. Um, so that it's become much simpler, much uh, less expensive, such that the smaller organizations now are able to, you know, go and, you know, uh, sign up for a Simpa or a Personio um, and, uh, you know, literally do it over the web like you do any other. Yeah. 
yeah. bit of software. So that's been the revolution recently, which is that these are not just the you know the purview of of the big companies anymore. You know, the smallest companies can use these platforms. Yeah, we kind of hack Slack to to include yeah. a lot of that measurability and stuff. But that sounds like the yeah. next level. So definitely something for for me to yeah. investigate there. Um, let's come back to the productivity puzzle and the the kind of paradox of this. So a lot of what you're talking about there, I guess, is this period of technological technological advancement and then productivity and and you know per capita GDP not keeping pace with the way that technology has changed. And yeah. um, so, so that's the thing that a lot of people are are failing to to really understand. What yeah. do you think is ultimately the the way to to solve that? And I suppose it's around how humans yeah. interact with with technology and machines, right? Yeah. So if we start with let's start with the cause. You know, what, why did this happen? Because in the '90s, when the internet was new, and I was early in my career, I was working at Anderson Consulting, which is Accenture today. Um, I worked in what was called change management, and our job, you know, throughout the '90s, my job was to help people align to this new technology. It was suddenly appeared on their desk. I mean, we forget yeah. that a PC on a desk in the nineties was the pretty, mm. you know, that was like, wow, what is this? You know? Um, and my son doesn't believe me when I say, you know, that we didn't have these things back then. But anyway, as these things appeared, we were really good in, in Europe and in North America in particular at bringing these technologies online and training people and, and providing communication and understanding of what this is and what it's for and how it works. And we saw massive, you know, record setting levels of productivity from about 92 to 2001. And then what we, what we saw, Graham, was that, um, uh, we, we saw the situation where, um, suddenly out of the blue, 9 11 happened. Yeah. Um, and if you remember, um, people panicked. Um, organizations panicked and, um, you know, just started cutting people left, right and center investment stopped. I remember being at, you know, at, 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 at Accenture at the time and all our projects just stopped. Um, but, but that, if you remember, that was quite brief, you know, everything kind of came back really quickly. Yeah. And I remember I was working with very senior people at the time, um, and organizations. They were like, God, we made a huge mistake. We let these people go and now we've got to get them back. And mm. it took years for people, you know, for them to get the talent back into the, into the organizations. And, um, uh, so that was the first shock. And then we kind of all got through that. And then the next shock, shock came, which was 2007, and that was, again, cut, 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 stopped investment. And so we had this period from 2001 to about 2015 where the amount of investment in aligning people to technology was minuscule. Yeah. And it took us to 2015 to get back to that. Um, and that's where we are now. We have kind of got back to those levels. So we're catching up. So that's the cause. That's part, big part of the cause. Now, what we do going forward is we continue to make these investments and we continue to recognize that we're almost at that stage now. Where, remember when the internet was new, we're at the stage now where the internet is becoming intelligent. Mm. Um, and the technology is becoming intelligent. And, it, and you know, are we going to harness this or are we going to be afraid of it? And what we need to do is invest and har- harness it so that people can go and do better in their jobs and do jobs that are more interesting to them and let the technology do the boring stuff. And, and so that's part of solving this, which is we're back to that point. We have invested. we got to keep going. So the question is, you know, are we going to be afraid of this intelligent technology um, and therefore kind of step back and, and not do the investment to aligning people to it, as I was discussing earlier. So we're kind of at that point where we were in the early 90s, where what, what we're having is we're going to have this super intelligent software, super imp- intelligent internet, and organizations that decide to invest in that and align people to that and make those investments are going to do really, really well. Those that don't um, are going to struggle. And the good news is what I've seen, and this is what I talk about in the book, is that I, organizations are seeing the opportunity. Mm-hmm. Um, now, the OE, OECD is not seeing that those organizations are seeing it, but they are. And I've worked in the software industry for a while now, and I've seen the investment and the seriousness by which people are saying, you know, wow, we're going to really be able to change the way we work. And I was saying a moment ago, the pandemic, you know, I think it has knocked us on to a different path, but it's a better one um, for, for the following reasons. I think, one, people have, have realized that working flexibly um, actually does improve productivity. Presenteeism, 
which was you know rife before, uh, didn't work. And I think managers who who have probably been guilty of that have probably started to relax a bit and say, hey, you know, actually this is good. I don't need to be, I don't need to be with my my team all the time. And they produce. You know, I think that's kind of broken that cycle. Hopefully, um, and I also think that the whole idea of um, uh, you know people not having to commute as much, which is which is draining. It really does drain people's um, you know energy and, and productivity. But I think we're also seeing. People are getting comfortable with the technology, right? To be able to see people on a screen. Yeah. Um, a lot of people are now used to having their Amazon Alexa or their Google Home next to them and helping them at work. And you're going to see these things all start to merge together into this kind of intelligent world where we're going to do more talking to uh, not only our colleagues, but to our machines. Um, and the machines are going to do stuff for us they didn't do before. Let me give you an example. So one of the things that a bit of drudgery for managers and, and uh, people these days is you have to sit down and do your objectives at the beginning of the year, right? Um, so you do that and then you have check-ins throughout the year. Well, you know, technology is coming very soon that it, you know, the, it will know you and your team and it will write those objectives for you uh, as a manager and employee. And all you need to do is sit down with your manager and you guys just tweak them a bit. So it's going to make what was, you know, an hour and a half long meeting, you know, 30 minutes because you're going to spend time talking rather than, you know, f- filling out check boxes. And mm. the systems are going to be really smart in that way. Um, and then they'll also be able to, you know, measure how you get on throughout the year, you know, as you do your check ins, you know, previous as you go. So things like that are going to make, you know, talent management become kind of not a transaction, but it's going to be ubiquitous and happening all the time. Um, and that'll be interesting. And again, you'll talk to these things. You'll be able to say, hey, your your machine will come on and say, hey, Tom has just asked for three weeks off. Can we give that to him? Yeah, go ahead. Approve that, please. You're not going on to you know, a couple of web pages, click, 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 trying to find it. Filing it just gets done. Paper yeah. And signing yeah. things and all yeah. that and stuff. You just, yeah. And you just get, or, or it could come back to you and say, hey, he's, he's only got two and a half weeks of holiday. Do you want to give him an extra few? Yeah, give them an extra few days, and and it'll be that kind of thing that you'll have. And, it, and people yeah. won't call that an HR system anymore. Um, mm-hmm. It's going to be this kind of you know ubiquitous performance support. And if we get that, and organizations invest uh, in that, and then teach people how to use these technologies carefully, I mean, I, I just think we're going to see tremendous productivity uplift, like we saw in the '90s at the beginning of the internet. It's going to be a new yeah. kind of era. Yeah. Here's the thing, right? Is that if you take the the typical view of technology from the present day projecting into the future, um, which I guess you could characterize it as the Jetsons view of technology, right? Do you remember the Hanna yeah. Barbera cartoon, the Jetsons? Uh, absolutely. So <laughs> this, so what the Jetsons predicted was that hey, we'll end up with you know machines that will vacuum clean the house for us, so we don't have to, and it'll cook our meals for us, so that we don't have to, and so on, and if you take that kind of view of technology as being a time saver convenience uh, kind of play, then what you should end up with in theory is people just get less busy. Right. And the, the, obviously the title of this podcast is beyond busy. (laughs) Yeah. Like, do you see that happening or do you just see that what will end up happening is that people will just be given four times the workload to manage and a bunch of machines and then, they'll be equally as busy nine to five, Monday to Friday and, and, and yeah. plus, some, plus some. Well, there's a, there's a couple of things there. Let me, let me start with one thing that I talk about a lot in the book, which is that um, it's, it is amazing at home. It is starting to become like Jetsons a bit, right? So I've got a fridge that has a camera in it that no, it can pick up that we're out of milk or eggs or things like that. And it'll order those and we get them on Friday. I mean, that's amazing, right? And then we've got our Google homes, all these sorts of things. So it is starting to turn into Jetsons. But when you go to work, does it look like that? Yeah. No. It's yeah. a it's a laptop with a screen and a mouse, and it that's what it looked like in '99, right? It really isn't any different. So we've got a problem to fix at first, which is we're more digital at home than we are at work. And for me, that's one of the reasons why we're we're struggling with productivity because we're still using you know very old technologies. We're using using Mac or Windows, and we're using a keyboard and a mouse, and you know. But we're at home, and we talk to our fridge, or we talk to you know the, these things, and they do things for us. We, we've got to get work to be like that. And I think, you know, now that people have been working home for nine months now, I think it's been, they are starting to, I think they are going to demand that that when I go back to the office and oh, by the way, I'm going to only be there three days a week. I want it to be like home, you know, where are these things? And, and this is what's good news. And I talk about in the book, CEOs have already seen this coming 
And that's what I'm always surprised in the past few years. When you meet with very senior executives, and they're like, I want work to look like home. You know, and and you sit there and think, wow, wow, really? And and they are, they really mean it. They get, they want retail grade experience at work. Um, and when we get to that point where where what we have at home also exists at work, and oh by the way, you're working some at home and you're working some in in the office. That's when we're going to see you know some some real leaps. And because the studies show our productivity at home has gone up dramatically in the past ten years with our devices and and that's so why I've seen that in my home. You've probably seen it in yours, but at work it's flat or going down. Well, well, that's part of the problem, right? Um, we're yeah. still in the 1990s. So, so I just I say that first, um, and I think this is where the pandemic is is you know tragic as it is, where it's it's pushing us in a different direction. It's going to require um, organizations to invest in some of these technologies, and it's going to it's going to require organizations to undertake flexible working. I, I cringe when I hear CEOs who are saying, wow, I'm really enjoying working at home. I'm going to get rid of the office. It's like, no, that's a really bad idea. You, know, you might just want to have less of it or less mm-hmm. people in the office. Yeah. But you know, people are going to basically be looking at two things, I think, for the future, which is um, working at home one or two days a week, and that's a permanent thing. They're also going to be looking for flexible work, which says, I will work during the hours that um, I can be most productive. Um, and so a lot of people have learned by working from home for so long that the first few hours in the day is children and they don't really get going till yeah. 10 and work, yeah. you know, organizations have become much more comfortable with that. Right. Um, and then evenings as well. And then so what you're finding is people will split their day up and say, I'll work from 10 to three, um, which there's no kids. And then, you know, between four and six, I'm with the kids. And then they pick up in the evening again for a few more hours. And, and you know, people are finding, and I'm certainly hearing, they're saying, wow, I'm just so much more productive now because I work in those times when I can be productive. Uh, and so I think we're going to have to see organizations change their policies, change their offices, um, and change their thinking um, to do that. And technology is going to be that, that kind of facilitator of, yeah. of these things to keep people yeah. productive. So. I, it, we're Jetsons at home, but we're not Jetsons at work yet. And we have to fix that, I think. So, yeah. Along yeah well, with these there's other there's definitely also some work to do. I'm not Jetsons at home. And the reason is I don't trust Amazon and Google and, <laughs> and yeah, all of that, enough. right? So it feels like that's also an issue that will play out at work. People yeah, well, like me yeah. will also not trust the idea of, you know, bosses listening to every half conversation I have with somebody at my desk, you know, all those kind of things. Right. So, yeah. So it feels like there's a, there's a huge debate, but I'm also convinced that that will be that. I, I think you're right. Ultimately, I, I think there's a bit for me, there's a bit more to do before, before the machines can actually, you know, predict objectives and, and, and all those things that you're talking about, but it, I, I'm, I'm totally convinced um, with what you're saying that it, it will go in that direction for sure. Yeah. Um, yeah. The technologies um, it's, it's here today. It's, you know, being rolled out by these, yeah. by these companies, but you're, you're right. I mean, you know, I, I've seen some pilots um, of uh, software that listens to conference calls yeah, um, and is used to identify people who are stressed or okay. depressed hmm. or, underworked people who who don't have enough work right yeah. and um you know this is something that um that some people are finding really controversial i have to say i'm not overly personally comfortable with that um but when it comes to people's well-being you know maybe the the benefit outweighs yeah. the risk um but you know we'll have to we'll have to see how that plays out but yeah it's it's interesting where that we'll see where this goes i guess it's also it's always to do with who who experiences the benefits of those things right so yeah. in some ways the i the rhythm of work is such that you will have time where you're overworked and you might be stressed and you'll also have time where perhaps you have a bit less on and for mm. most people that just kind of evens out over the year right whereas if you had machines saying oh graham's only got four objectives to do right now give him some more yeah. give him some more actually you could end up in a in a bad place. So I guess it depends on who, yeah, you know, who you ultimately could. gets to experience the benefits of those things. Yeah. And, and to your point earlier about, you know, well, well, people will, will kind of finish their work and could they take more on? Yeah. Um, and I think this is, I don't know the answer to this yet, but I, I do think that people working flexibly are going to be more productive. And therefore then the question is, well, then do you give them more? 
Um, and it, you don't necessarily give them more hours, but you give them, hey, well, here's some more work. Could you do this as well? And I think it's going to be really interesting to see how this plays out over the next couple of years in terms of people's productivity is going to start going up. Well, then what do we do? Do we make them work longer? I think the, the, the length of the day doesn't matter. It's, you know, how much can you get done in a period of time? So we'll see. We'll see where that goes. But I've, I've thought for a long time that the, the best thing you can have to to reward your career success is not a pay rise, but a time rise. Right? Yeah. So we should look at productivity as, mm. you know, your job is to produce X amount of stuff, whether that's widgets or ideas or mm-hmm. reports or whatever it is that you do. And once you get that, if yeah. you can, if you start to do that in, in fewer days, then you get a, you get a time rise and then you get more of that time back. And yeah. I think we should, we should be looking at human progress as, you know, how do we delegate more of these things to the machines? Mm. Yeah. And, I like and that. End up, in a, yeah. end up in a time where we're yeah. engaged in meaningful work, but yeah. probably our normal structure of nine to five starts to start yeah. to disappear. It is. And we've already seen that happen. And I really like that, Graham. I'm going to borrow that. I hope you don't mind. I'll give you credit <laughs> for it, but a time rise, but, but I, I do, I talk about this in the book exa- exactly, which says, why do we work 40 hours a week? It, it, we, and nobody can answer that other than we've always done it this way. The fact is, is that a number of studies by Deloitte's and McKinsey's and others has come back to say the ideal amount of hours people spend at work on average is somewhere between 32 to 34 hours. Um, and that's when they're most productive. When you give yeah. them, when you say you work 40 hours, people will find a way to fill that with stuff. Yeah. And that is not necessarily a good thing, right? And so, the, you know, the experiments and a number of companies and governments have experimented with, we're going to do three, four day weeks. And it's really interesting that the behavior change, you get people really focused for those three days um, and they get a lot done. And then, as you say, then they get a time rise. Well, then they're third, yeah. they have Friday, Saturday, Sunday yeah. off. And, um, you know, that idea of a time rise, uh, is very valuable to people. Um, they can For say, sure. well, keep me on the same pay, but I'll, you know, if I could have more time off, that would be great. Do you know, one of the, one of the main, so my company, Think Productive, we do a four day week. And one of the main studies that we looked at that we, we used to kind of make that decision was they did a follow up study to the, the famous Ford on productivity study, mm-hmm. which kind of irks back yeah. to why we do Monday to Friday, nine to five. Exactly. Yeah. And essentially, you know, Henry Ford came up with the idea that if people do 40 hours of, of work on, a, on an assembly line and then they rest their bodies, then their bodies yeah. don't wear out and they can, they can continue working. But of course, in knowledge work, what this study found was that, like you say, the, the law of diminishing returns kicks in much earlier. It's, you know, 32, does, yeah. 34 hours rather than 40. Mm-hmm. And so like, yeah, we, we, we kind of took that decision that it would be better for us to work a four day week because we keep people you know, um, rested and, and, you know, just really yeah, that's great. sharper. Yeah. And I just feel like that's got to be the, the longer term way, the way that we go. Cause as you say, it feels, it feels like we're very much basing a lot of these systems on the industrial age rather than knowledge work and the information age. Yeah, we are. And people really appreciate that because, you know, it just, as you say, having that time, but it's really interesting. I think, you know, we also see that um, people having that extra time, it gives them headspace yeah. to think of things yeah. that they can bring into work and, and over and over again, data showing that, that, that the amount of innovation starts to go up as, as well as a result of, of this kind of giving people that time, space and headspace. Um, I'm a, I'm a big fan of it. And, and, you know, I, I have to, confess that you know early in my career working at anderson which became accenture you know i was one of those 60 70 hour day you know kind of guys and i look back and go that yeah yeah, that was crazy (laughs) and yeah sorry per per you know working you know 20 you know 60 60 hours hours a day sometimes yeah sorry 60 70 hours a week and i think we were just kidding ourselves it was Mm. we were having diminishing returns left and right no doubt about it yeah I'm pretty making mistakes. So, you, I mean, you, so you've worked with, with Anderson, you've worked with Accenture and IBM, and it, you've been involved in quite a lot of big human capital programs and, you know, been really focused on, on programs to do with people in a variety of different industries and around the world, right? So mm-hmm. the Americas, yeah. Europe, Asia. So I just wondered what, what's been your learning from that and reflections from that just to do with, just to do with people, you know, so how people are managed, how people are led. Um, yeah. What What are some of the differences that you notice kind of culturally? Um, what have been your biggest learnings from that? 
Yeah, so I'll start at the highest level and say the thing that I learned that really surprised me is no matter where you go in the world and whatever industry, whatever um, you know, region you're in, people just – have a universal need to know, you know, what is it you want me to do? And when I did it, did I do a good job? Mm, That's right. just human, right? And everybody has this kind of, and I, I've never buy into this, you know, this idea that says, well, you know, give humans, um, you know, the opportunity, they'll slack off. It's just, I don't think humans think that vast majority don't think mm. that way. So that was one thing I saw wherever I went, you know, people want to do an interesting job. They want to do it well, and they want it to get re- to be recognized. Um, and that doesn't even need to be money. It can just be, hey, that was a good job. You know, that, that's what I found. Now, what what I found that was that was different though um, culturally is uh, one of the first things I learned when I when I went uh, when I was at IBM in two thousand six, seven, eight, spending a lot of time in China. That was the hot place at the at that point. And one of the things I did learn, it was vastly different, is giving feedback or coaching to somebody from Chinese or Asian culture generally is you have to do it really carefully because um, there's a whole um, kind of Confucian or other sort of you know um, philosophical about, about saving face, um, and we had to learn very early on that you know you don't want to pull somebody aside after a meeting and say hey you should have done it this way that way this way because that's devastating for them right mm. you have to think about you know how you give feedback that's about saving face. Now the other thing I learned after spending a lot of time in China that people in China moved we almost kind of met in the middle where you could start to give direct feedback. Um, they started to, to welcome it once they got used to it. And, you know, we got better at providing feedback because we, we had some more sensitivity. Whereas in the West, we'd just be like, you know, really blunt and say, well, you know, you messed that up, right? Yeah. You know, and, and, and so it kind of brought things into the middle. So that was really interesting to learn. Kind of, kind of layers that. of bluntness in the West though, isn't it? Like layers the, of blunt. The, and that's the sort of yeah. Dutch through the Americans to the English and probably. Exactly. So I'd put the Dutch and the, and the South Africans on one yeah, end of bluntness. Yeah. And then you go to say Japan, which is, I mean, it's just, you know, any rudeness would be just horrifying yeah. and devastating, you know? And yeah, that's the one thing that I found that was really different in how you talk and the levels of bluntness. I'm going to borrow that one as well, Grant. Um, <laughs> the levels of bluntness that you can, the blunt, you can use. It's like a bluntness uh, sort of uh, scale yeah. indicator, isn't it? Spectrum, but, yeah. <laughs> so I'm just really interested in that, the thing about, the saving face in uh, China and Asian cultures. So yeah. what, like, what did you find yourself doing to get around that so that you could, cause you still need to give that feedback and try and change behavior. So what's the, what's the difference in, in yeah. that approach? Well, the first, the first thing that you have to recognize is you need to show the person you understand that that for them is inappropriate you know, okay. to do so, so understanding and saying, yeah, okay, I need to be a bit, bit careful. Um, the, I think the second thing is, um, then behaving in that way so that you build trust with that person, um, to show that you do get it, um, and that you, you know, you can be, you can be reasonable and respectful. Um, but then what I learned is then you can start to, and I learned this in, uh, you know, in, in some other, you know, even European cultures, you can start to move to kind of this middle level of understanding. And all humans need to know is where each other are coming from. And a yeah. lot can be forgiven. A lot can be okay. forgiven once yeah. you know that. And and so that was another thing I learned is once that you build that trust, and it can be done really quickly, um, you know, in most most cultures, um, you can build it really quickly. And then And then just consistency of behavior after that you know, not either that person or you doing something that's like way out of bounds, you know, from what you seem to have agreed. Right. Mm. And then it's just an evolution. You both kind of learn as, as you go along. And I, I learned certainly as, and I've been living in Britain for, for 20, nearly 25 years now. And I, you know, when I first came over here from America, I learned really quickly the way Americans do things, which can be really kind of, you know, a bit roughshod, run roughshod over anybody who's kind of in the way, you know, the rest of the world just isn't like that. Mm. Um, and, and, there's, again, there's various spectrums of degrees of that. Um, and I would say, actually, Britain's become a little bit more like America since I've been here. Yeah. Um, but but that, that's kind of, you know, that that, that aspect. But what, what, another interesting culture, the thing that I learned when I moved here, and I see this throughout the world, um, Americans and certain Asian countries and a few other types of countries that are kind of work 24 hours a day, seven days a week kind of cultures. Um, so you see that in Korea, Japan. 
the United States. And and when I moved to the UK, I was really baffled when I was given four weeks of vacation, which I'd never had before. <laughs> yeah. And was on, I was being measured on, was I taking it? Yeah. Right. <laughs> Whereas in America, yeah. it was I had two weeks if I was lucky. And it was a discouraged from taking it. Mm. Right. And yep. so this is something I learned when I moved to Europe. I think Europe is particularly good. The French and the English and others, very good about holidays. And it, it, it befuddled me for a while, but I kind of got into the swing of school holidays and started to, and I've always taken my holiday. And what I learned from that was that in the U.S., this kind of go, go, go all the time or in some parts of Asia, go, go all the time. It is um, my teams in the U.K. have always been more productive than my American teams were. Um, and I put that mm. down to the fact that people are regularly every six weeks t taking a break. Uh, and I learned really quickly that that was really important. Um, and so, but what's interesting, you started to see America moved more towards Europe's approach to it now, where you do see students taking a gap year now, which would have been unheard of when I right. was a student. Yeah. You, you're starting to see people insist on four weeks of holiday and taking it. Um, and so you're sort of seeing the U.S. look at Europe and say, well, hang on, why are they as productive or more productive than we are? And they have all this time off. I mean, look at the French. They're always on holiday, right? Is the it isn't true, but it's kind of the perception. But so I, that was one thing I noticed really different culturally when I moved uh, here. And then whenever I would go to, to certain parts of Asia, I'd be like, wow, it's like America here, you know. Um, yeah. But I think globally, people are starting to look at that and in, in those cultures and say, hang on, maybe this isn't the right way to do it. And I think, you know, part of that is about work-life balance too, isn't it? So I think when you're going through a period of high stress and chasing lots of deadlines and so on, tiny things can seem like huge things. Yeah. And sometimes that grounding that you get just from doing the, the kids half term or taking part of the, the school summer holidays or whatever it is, just allows you to just step back from what you're doing. And, you know, and, and I, I think probably I have some of my, my best bigger ideas about managing my work and my career when I'm sat on the beach or just when I'm disengaged from work, you know, you almost need to step mm. out of it sometimes to really be able to see how it all fits and what's next and yeah. that kind of stuff. So do you think that's true? And I, and also like, I suppose linked to that coming from that American culture, I'm really interested to know how that affected your own view of work-life balance. So have you kind of changed how you view work by being an, an Anglophile as you are now? Yeah. Well, um, it took many, many years for me to change. And I would say it wasn't until um, I left IBM really in 2011. Mm. Um, where I, and I actually took some time to say, right, I'm going to step back. Yeah. I'm going to stop the travel. Because um, I did. I was going seven days a week traveling around the world. And I was, I, you know, took that and said, look, I'm going to support my, my book. It was the first one that, that I co-wrote with some folks. And, and I moved to a smaller firm as well. I said, right, I'm going to get off the big corporate you know thing and i moved to become a managing director of a small uk firm 300 people i guess not that small but um and that's when i started to realize um that i needed to change i kind of got out of, off that treadmill and really it's been since then you know 2011 12 i i've started to change um and then i i retired in in january um uh, which was fantastic timing because then I ended up in lockdown. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> but I call it pro tire because um, I'm kind of done with the corporate world. I'm kind of, yeah. you know, I don't have to work anymore, but I'm only 56. So, you know, I want to continue. So I call it pro tire. So I've pro tired and I'm going to save a lot of time for things I like doing, like playing in my band and, and mm -hmm. um, being on and my boat. you've got a, got a bass guitar behind you there. <laughs> yeah, I've got a few guitars yeah. out there. Yeah, we're doing some recording at the moment. Technology nice. is amazing these days, so we can record and share stuff. And, yeah, nice. and Yeah, it's, it's yeah. quite remarkable. But, and we can rehearse. You know, we spent lockdown rehearsing for a gig in July. But wow. anyway, um, but, but yeah, so, so I have, I've, I've now prioritized that time in the band and recording and then time on my boat which I, I love staying on my mm. boat. So I spent most of the summer there once we got out of lockdown. And then now I'm just doing, you know, bits of work and I'm doing things like, you know, doing podcasts, which I enjoy spending time with you, Graham, on here. Yeah. So um, so it took me a long time to kind of get to that place. And I look back, as I said a moment ago, when I was at Accenture, I'm like, what was I thinking? I was, I was kidding myself and I was kidding my teams, you know, into thinking we were like these, you know, amazingly productive people when it, it just couldn't have been the case really. Yeah. Um, 
Tell yeah, me more so, about pro time and we've got a few minutes left and I'd love to just dig into that some more. Cause that just feels like a yeah very on topic thing for beyond busy. So I suppose my, my first question is, so you're, you're, it's not like you hit a milestone age. You didn't get to 65 and say, right <laughs> now, this is when I should retire. So I should retire yeah. now. So you're 56. So, and pro time and is, you, you know, you're deliberately not saying you're retired. You're deliberately changing the definition of that. Yeah. So is that just a mindset or is that, did you have measures in place, you know, financially or hours per week or something like that to, that you wanted to hit with that? Like, how did you, how did you know that you'd reach the point of I'm now going to be in this pro time and phase? Yeah. I mean, I actually ran into this term when I was researching the book and it's an old term. It was 1961. It was coined and it just disappeared. And okay. I kind of have dredged it back up again. Right. And I've written a couple of blogs about it, um, which will be coming out shortly. Um, and so I just thought, and I, I thought, right, this is really interesting because I did have in mind that when I get to 30 years of doing big jobs, corporate jobs, that that was a time to kind of say, right, let's, let's step back. So yeah, I had a financial target, um, you know, which I met in inside of that 30 years, which was important because finances are, are really important and part of pro retirement. And what you have to do is you just have to decide what you, you can live on and what you want to yeah. live on. And, and that's different for different people. Um, but it is important to have that kind of, you know, that, that security. So that, that's the first thing. The second thing so is just on, then, the, on the financial yeah. target. So that's not about, um, that's not about one, you know, sort of big totalizer number. That's more about saying, right, this is how much I would need every month. And what I currently have and investments yeah. and everything kind of gives me enough to exactly to, to know that I could I could walk away from work and, and be OK. Exactly. You know, for exactly. Yeah, that's exactly right. So and, you know, that, those two things just coincided, which was nice. So I thought, yeah. right, you know, but when I said to my wife, I said, look, I found this thing called pro time and I think I'm going to do it. Um, her first point was like, well, hang on, what is it? And um, you're not going off and golfing and spending time on the boat, you know, every day for now for the very future. Because my father retired at my age and, okay. you know, he literally stopped and golfed. And, you know, that was bad for his health. He died fairly young and I've seen oh, wow. lots of people yeah. and in fact the UK um, chief medical officer a couple of years ago and this is in the book as well did a study on men who do some sort of gainful employment till about 70 mm. and it shows the, the vast majority of them will live to 90 oh, wow. um, yeah. you know as long as you didn't have any underlying you know and it's really good for you apparently to keep doing things I suppose anyway, so, it just keeps your brain engaged it, and sharp exactly, and it kind yeah. of forces you to stay at that at that yeah. level doesn't it so it does and i saw my yeah. uncles and my my father and my grandfather who were worked in the factories and they had really nice retirements but yeah their health went down downhill really quickly mm. so i don't want to be like but that's that's only a part of it but the other part was really to say right what am i going to do with my time my wife said you need a plan i said well i've got the book coming out so i'm going to support that and then you know i get asked i sit on the board of a couple of companies and i get asked to do advisory yeah. and so i've just set up i've got a website um which one of my book is, is sits and then my services as well and yeah so I'm, I'm doing these on my own time and i've been really lucky in that people are coming to me i haven't had to chase it a lot um mm. and i can choose the things i want to do and the ones i don't want to do and it's just it's a real nice feeling i just it's just unfortunate that it coincided with lockdown <laughs> so but i'm looking forward to eventually yeah. properly retiring when the pandemic is is gone but that's the idea of it and you know people have to decide and some people say look i'm going to downsize to achieve the financial and you know, and I, I'd be all for that if you if you can do that, you should because I mean, really, as you said, time rise, you know, a time rise. Give yourself yeah. a massive time rise by saying, right, I'm going to downsize. You know, other people say, no, I don't want to downsize. I want to continue with my standard of living, and that's a personal decision that you have to take. But I would argue that people, once you've got to your fifties, and you you'll have this when you get there, Graham, someday when you get to your 50s, you'll have built some sort of expertise, right? And yeah. you can sell that these days. You can crowdsource that expertise. Um, and you can keep a bit of income coming in. You can keep your mind going. You can. It keeps me learning, right? I have to learn mm. new stuff to advise you know, CEOs of companies. <laughs> um, and so I'm finding it so far. It's been really, really, really a lot of fun. And I probably will properly reti uh, retire in, I don't know, five or 10 years and won't do any more uh, of that kind of work. But you know, for now, I want to keep going, but I want to have the control um, of when I do that. Yeah. I really like that idea because I've heard people say, people, you know, in their, in their sixties and maybe even seventies say, Hey, I'm going to carry on working like this till the day I die. Cause I love it. And you get the, you get the sense that, 
some of that is about the the addiction to stress mm. and the lifestyle and and all of that um you know and i i took a year sabbatical in 2017 where i decided to to deliberately not work for a year for the first time in my life like i you know i was doing paper around six days a week when I was 12 and I've always had that work <laughs> ethic. I was doing that as well. Yeah. Right. And, yeah. Uh, you know, and, and sort of working all through university to fund studies and all this stuff. And, and I, and I realized that I'd never had a period in my life where I, I didn't work, you know, from when I was kind of, you know, old enough to, mm. and I think the best thing I learned through doing this year's sabbatical was that I'm going to, I'm going to knock retirement out of the park. Like I, because like, I just <laughs> took up some volunteering and I, you know, yeah. just increase my social life a bit. And um, you can always find things to potter around the house and, and tidy up and, and do and so on. And I, and I really felt like, oh, I, this is a real surprise to me, but I think I'll be okay at retiring. But yeah. I, I sometimes feel that there are people who they, you know, maybe should take that kind of middle step, like you've talked about there. So pro, pro time and, and, and keep, keep their toe in, but also be conscious that they're you know, financially and and lifestyle wise, kind of in in a different phase, and just don't. Yeah. And yeah. so, and so, I just really like that approach, and um, yeah, you've you've inspired me to think about my own pro time and and, and when, <laughs> when that might come further down the line. And um, we've got to wrap up um, really shortly, so um, I'd love you to just uh, like if you want more clients because <laughs> you're in this pro time phase, but just let Always. people know where they can get hold of you, and also um, just tell us about the book and anything else you want to mention. Sure. So first of all, um, you can get the book on Amazon. It's um, on Amazon UK. It's solving the productivity puzzle. There aren't any other Tim Ringos in the UK. So uh, <laughs> if you Google me, you can find it that all way right. as well. Um, and uh, yeah, in terms of finding me and more about me, uh, it's timringo.com. Really, really simple. Uh, and on there, you'll find more about my my, my upcoming book, um, my current book and past books, um, and also services that I provide. One that I've just launched is... Um, is um, uh, what I call young professional mentoring. So um, to help people that are starting out in their careers um, nice. and, and mentor them through their uh, their first few years to set them up for success. So that's a new service I've added as of uh, this week, actually. So so yeah, it's timringo.com. Yeah, and that sounds like a really good thing to tap into the benefit of your experience and being able to pass that on. That sound, sounds like a really good thing. So yeah. Tim, just want to say thanks for being on Beyond Busy. It's been a pleasure having you on. And Thank uh, you. It's been a pleasure to be on, yeah. Look forward to uh, you sharing some of your music with me when uh, when the recordings are done. I will do. I'll send something <laughs> on to you. I'll send you the blog on ProTime as well. I'll send that to you. That'd be great. Yeah, yeah. yeah, send me yeah. the blog on, on ProTime and we'll link that in the show notes as well. Cool, we'll do it. Great stuff. Thanks, Tim. See you later. This video is sponsored by Think Productive, home of the Productivity Ninja. We help people and organizations to increase their impact and make space for what matters through a range of workshops, programs, and coaching. Head to thinkproductive.com to find out more. Are you interested in booking me as a speaker for your event? You want to sign up for my Rev Up for the Week email? Do you want to buy some of my books or do you just want to find out what I'm doing right now? It's all at grahamalcott.com forward slash links. And if you like this video, please like, subscribe and share so we can make more. Thanks for watching.